I've been diagnosed twice with narcissistic personality disorder and once with borderline psychopathy. And I have paid the ultimate price for these all-pervasive cancers of the soul. I have lost fortunes, family, and everything else one can lose, reputation and so on, several times. I've, I've added time in jail uh, for securities fraud and so on. Are you a narcissist? Have you or are you currently dating a narcissist? What about psychopaths? Ever meet a charming, well-spoken person but feel like there's something not quite right about them? The narcissist acts out and ruins everything and everyone around him, most specifically himself. So this is the danger in narcissism because narcissists are great actors. They, they con the system, the ones who can deceive everyone all the time. This is the danger. They are stealthy. And I would beg to differ with you that they are human. And technically, as far as biology goes, they are human, but not as far as their psychology goes. As far as the psychology of the narcissist goes, the narcissist is, is an alien, an extraterrestrial on Earth. Today on the Shy Man's Dating School podcast series, we delve into the deeply dark and disturbing world of narcissism. Stephen Davis speaks with Sam Vaknin, a twice-diagnosed cerebral narcissist who authored the book Malignant Self-Love. Today they speak about the traits of narcissists and psychopaths, and about the women who date them. So first of all, there is the issue of the narcissist tends to blame his mistakes, failures, so on, on others. The world is, is guilty. Everyone is guilty. Everyone is responsible for what's happening to the narcissist, except himself. He, he never takes responsibility. The narcissists are very eager. If you date a narcissist, he pushes you to get married on the second date, planning on having children on the first date, and he immediately tells you that you have the love of his life. So stay tuned to the Shy Man's Dating School podcast series, where today we find out, are you a narcissist? I'm fascinated by human behavior mm -hmm. and I'm clear that there's just so many personality types, points of view, just ways people are that I'm not aware of, or I'm, I've never experienced myself or, <laughs> or I experienced, but I don't know that's what it is. You've clearly um, researched this, investigated it, organized thoughts about it. I'd love to find out about your journey to the place where you are now as a resource. Now you're a resource for this. It's a pretty straightforward arrow in my case. I've been diagnosed twice with narcissistic personality disorder and once with borderline psychopathy. And I have paid the ultimate price for these all-pervasive cancers of the soul. I have lost fortunes, family, and everything else one can lose, reputation and so on, several times. I've, I've added time in jail uh, for securities fraud and so on. So having hit rock bottom several times, having hit rock bottom and bounced and then hit yeah. rock bottom and bounced, I decided that I would like to discover the laws of physics that regulate this bouncing motion. And what I came across was the general topic of personality disorders. In 1995, when I embarked on my path of self-discovery, there was there's no awareness of pathological narcissism. It was an obscure sub 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 field which had been neglected for decades. Freud, Sigmund Freud was the first to coin the term narcissism in 1916. And then there were sporadic studies in the early to mid 70s. And that's more or less it. No one has paid attention to pathological narcissism. Definite, definitely not on the scale that it is being studied today. It's a cottage industry and, and a major driver of psychological research in faculties and universities Across, across the globe, especially in the United States. But at that time, there was nothing, absolutely nothing. Consequently, I had to essentially invent, invent the whole field single-handed. I have written a book in 1995, which was the first book to describe and coin the phrase narcissistic abuse. I also had to come up with a whole language. Most of the language used today to describe and tackle this extremely uh, untoward phenomenon uh, was invented by me in the in the mid 90s so narcissistic supply somatic narcissists cerebral narcissists they are all terms i had to invent as i was plowing along into this terra incognita but ultimately after a journey of several years i i thought that i have reached a modicum of self awareness and self uh, self revelation and then i branched out i established support groups online uh, well over 100,000 people joined wow. with the first two years. 
That's yeah, amazing. Which was, uh, yeah, it, it, it indicated, it was, it was an indicator of how serious and, and how ubiquitous the problem was. Were you shocked by the number? Yeah, very much so. I thought I was alone. That, wow. that characterizes many mentally ill people. They, they think they're alone. Absolutely. And, and then there was this whole thing of victims of narcissistic abuse. And so by now, I think narcissism is a well-established clinical phenomenon as well as a well-understood path towards abuse, violence, and aggression in, in, in myriad forms. That's how I got into this mess. Wow, that must have been really pioneering work. Must have felt like you were um, doing it alone. Yeah, for a while I have been alone, completely yes. alone. And but then you know there was an avalanche of of uh, scholars, self-styled scholars, uh, experts, victims, ex-victims, would-be victims, wanna-be victims, <laughs> narcissists, and psychopaths thrilled to discover that there's a name and a label and a handle to what's happening to them. And then that there was the narcissism pride movement. And, so today you can find narcissists and psychopaths online saying we are the next evolutionary stage, you know, we are, yeah. we are the epitome and, uh, of, of human achievement and we are superior to other human beings. That's why we feel superior. The, hence, hence the source of our arrogance and haughtiness because we really are. You have manifestations of the study of narcissism which are both benign and cancerous as, as, as is the case for every other yes. social movement or phenomenon. And it probably lets you know that it's reached a certain uh, degree of success or oh yeah you can't open you can't open television today you can't you can't watch a movie you can't watch a, a crime serial you can't watch a, watch a police procedural where, where the word narcissism doesn't crop up people use narcissism as a, as a pejorative term they hurl narcissism they, it's, a, it's a curse word you know and it's it's, uh, it's all over the place today narcissism is is really in a way the name of the game. But more seriously, it is beginning to be thought of, pathological narcissism is beginning to be thought of as the root cause of many other hitherto ostensibly unrelated mental health disorders. So we're beginning to see a common root for all these disorders, especially what used to be called cluster B disorders, which means antisocial, borderline, narcissistic, yes. histrionic, but also other, other types of, for instance, there is a, a, a very close behavioral, at least, match between Asperger's. Uh, autistic spectrum disorders and and narcissism. Uh, there is there are bipolar disorder, especially the manic phase, which resemble narcissism very very closely. And generalized anxiety disorder also has. So we're beginning to see that pathological narcissism rears its ugly head in in a multitude, multifarious mental health disorders. And because what is narcissism? Narcissism is our core. That's who we are. It's about self esteem, self worth self-confidence and in short it's a pathology of the self so if, if the self if the self is involved in everything and in every mental health disorder can you tell me what it's like to have this it sucks <laughs> it sounds like it it's a self-defeating self-destructive uh, disorder in a variety of, of ways it, uh, it impacts on one's ability to to act in the world and on the world it affects gravely and irre irreversibly and ineluctably interpersonal disorder, interpersonal relationships. So all forms of intimacy, the ability to collaborate with other people in teamwork, right. the ability to function, and so on and so forth. And mind you, there are functional narcissists and functional psychopaths, and they, for a while, you know, make it to the pinnacle. They, they are the pillars of the community, and they become everything from your local parish priest to the president of the United States. But then, but then they self-implode, then they, they self-destruct. And depending on, on the level they have attained, depending on their accomplishments, they take with them numerous people. So if you're a small-time guy, you take your family with you. Right. But if you're the president of the United States, you take the whole nation with you. Right. But one thing is inevitable and, um, and, you know, unavoidable. And that is the self-implosion. So for a while, a narcissist, for, for a while, when I say a while, it could be decades. A narcissist can be totally functional and give the outward impression of having having made it. But then as stresses accumulate, uh, he, the narcissist acts out, um, lashes out, implodes, explodes, and ruins everything and everyone around him, most specifically himself. So this is the danger in narcissism because narcissists are great actors. They have thespian skills. They con, they con the system and they, con, they are 
the ones who can deceive everyone all the time. This is the danger. They are stealthy. They're all around, and they're stealthy. And I would beg to differ with you that they are human. You said that the, narcissism is a human manifestation. And, and technically, as far as biology goes, physiology perhaps, biochemistry, they are human, but not as far as their psychology goes. As far as the psychology of the narcissist goes, the narcissist is, is an alien, an extraterrestrial on Earth a form of artificial intelligence. And that is because the narcissist lacks the basic machinery, the basic apparatus of which, which is required in order to qualify as a human being. Narcissists have no empathy. Narcissists have no emotions or no access to emotions. Narcissists are robotic because they are like cruise missiles. They home in on narcissistic supply, attention, adulation, admiration, being feared. They, home in, they, are, like, they are more like drug addicts. Mm -hmm. They are junkies, um, but junkies which are, who are also devoid of major dimensions of what it means to be human. So it's a very frightening phenomenon actually it's a it's a horror movie it's a yes. nightmarish proposition it's not like you know other things like i don't know bipolar bipolar you're up you're down it's a human experience to be bipolar to be depressed right. be manic it's a human experience even to be schizophrenic or schizophrenic paranoid paranoia right. it's human to be paranoid from time to time all of us are paranoid yes. it's human to be to be you know it's human to be everything else except a psychopath it is not human to be a psychopath it is outside the realm and the spectrum of human experience and um, and the same goes for a nurse i've never looked at it that way but that really makes sense. Before I called you, I thought about how I haven't, I would say I haven't come across many narcissists or psychopaths, probably um, in business more than anywhere else. Mm -hmm. But I'm getting the sense that I'm just not aware of it. Across them, I'm just not aware of it. Yeah, you're definitely coming across them. Statistically speaking, 1% of all the population are narcissistic or psychopathic. So you must have come across several in yes, your lifetime. For sure. But I think the statistics are grossly underestimated because narcissists and psychopaths do not subject themselves to rigorous testing, let alone treatment. So it's safer to think that something like, I don't know what, 5%, 7% of the population have pronounced narcissistic and psychopathic tendencies. Now, you're right, though, that narcissists tend to gravitate towards specific professions where they can wield power when they can make money, when they can garner adulation and admiration. So they would, you, you, you are more likely to find narcissists in show business, in, uh, among the clergy, in law enforcement, uh, in, the, in the judiciary, in politics. So you're more likely to find narcissists where narcissistic supply is, is more plenty plentiful. Yeah. So they gravitate to these professions. And so your, your statement that you mostly have come across them in a business environment strikes me as true and, right. and correct. How would I, if I wanted to increase my awareness so that I was <laughs> more um, able to identify that trait in people, is there a particular thing I would look for? If you are sensitized and aware you can spot them on the first date. If you are not, it would take you a decade. That's so educa scary. education, education, education is very, very important. And since sensitization and exposure to other people's experiences and to literature online and offline, these are critical. Otherwise, it's very easy not to spot a narcissist or a psychopath until it's way, way too late. I can give you a few markers if you, if you wish. So first of all, there is the issue of what we call alloplastic defenses. The narcissist uh, tends to blame his mistakes failures and so on on others the world is, is guilty his boss is guilty the, the the company is guilty his family is guilty everyone is guilty everyone's responsible for what's happening to the narcissist except himself he, he never takes responsibility and we call this an external locus of control it's like the narcissist's life is controlled from the outside the next thing is narcissists are very hypersensitive they pick a fight they feel constantly slighted injured insulted they're hypervigilant so they are on the guard, on on guard at all times. You know they are. They're a bit a bit paranoid. They tend to treat weak people, animals, sick people, and children impatiently and cruelly. They're very cruel, and they express negative and aggressive emotions towards their inferiors or people they perceive to be inferior, like people who are poorer yes. or more stupid or needy or, sent or sentimental or disabled. They usually have a history of aggression and and, uh, and violence, sometimes bordering on the criminal and sometimes criminal. Uh, 
Uh, so violent offenses, uh, battering, domestic violence, and so on is very common among narcissists and psychopaths. At the very least, they would be ver- verbally, verbally violent, verbally abusive. So they, they would use a vile language infused with expletives, threats, and, and the general impression would be hostility, that of, that of hostility. Now, narcissists are very eager. If you date a narcissist, he pushes you to get married on the second date, and he's planning on having children on the first date, and he immediately tells you that you have the love of his life. And and he's pressing you for exclusivity, for instant intimacy, and almost rapes you and, and acts jealous, uh, you know, on, and this is incommensurate with the time lag, like it happens on the first or second date. So they're very possessive and very eager. And then there's the issue of boundaries and privacy. Narcissists and psychopaths do not recognize other people's boundaries and privacy. They ignore your wishes, your rules, your rules of conduct. They, they select from the menu. They choose which movie you're going to see. They never consult you. They disrespect you. They treat you as an object or an instrument of gratification, you know. They go through your personal belonging while waiting for you. <laughs> they text you or phone you multiple times and so on and so forth. They, it's just, it's, you, have, you have the increasingly distinct feeling that you don't really exist, that the narcissist sees through you, that you're transparent. And then the narcissist, narcissists and psychopaths are control freaks, so they must control the situation and you compulsively. So they insist to ride, uh, if, you, if you date a narcissist, she would insist to ride in her car. She would hold on to the car keys. She would hold on to the money, to the theater tickets, to the air tickets, to your bag. She would disapprove if you are if you stay away for too long. I don't know. You go mm-hmm. to the to the loo. She would interrogate you when you return. So she, they're very insecure, actually. So they they compensate for that by being control freaks, and they make it very clear that in future you would need their permission to do things, even innocuous things like meeting your friends or visiting with your family. They would tend to isolate you from the very, very beginning. So they would disparage your friends. They would criticize your friends. They would tell you that, you know, they're, they're, your friends are beneath you. They, you deserve better. And they would try to isolate you from your family. And finally, they, they usually act in a patronizing, haughty, condescending manner. They criticize you often. They emphasize your smallest, minutest faults. They devalue you. They exaggerate. On, so on the one hand, so it's a pendulum. It's called idealization, devaluation. On the one hand, they will they they exaggerate your talents, your traits, and your skills. They idealize you because by idealizing you, they are idealizing and aggrandizing themselves. You know. And on the other hand, at, with the same breath, you know, on a dime, they, they they turn on a dime and they they hurl at you the most abusive invectives and criticism. And this pendulum is is very very telling. And they would tend to diminish you, harass you, ridicule you. And then switch immediately to saccharine, right. sugary, sugary compliments, and so the, this this pendular movement, this fluct- these fluctuations are very, very telling. This is a very partial list, but you know, even if you implement this list, you're likely to spot narcissists and psychopaths. Not to oversimplify, but it's it sounds like the story of so many of women who a relationship where they get abused, and initially they liked all the attention, they liked how important they were to the other person, they liked that the other person kind of controlled you know or led the relationship and then it gets really volatile with that swing back and forth between the verbal abuse and the making up narcissists and psychopaths fulfill deep emotional needs in their partners the bonding is not accidental I mean, many women would fall for a narcissist or a, or a psychopath on a first date because they're very charming and yeah. they, have, they, they, they home in on you. They are like lasers, you know, they, they, you are the center, suddenly the center of the universe. The most amazing and thrilling and, and fascinating being. And so it's very flattering and it's very difficult to resist. So many a woman would fall for a narcissist, but very few would remain with a narcissist after a certain, you know, and those who remain have a very, have a very have highly specific psychological profile. Those who tolerate the abuse and even welcome it, those who settle in and adapt themselves to the narcissist's specific needs and requirements, those women have a, a highly specific psychological profile. Uh, before, I, before we continue, I want to make clear that 75% of all diagnosed narcissists are male, but 25% of all diagnosed narcissists are female. So we do have women narcissists, female narcissists. It's, it's not an exclusive preserve of men. But throughout this conversation, I would tend to use the, the, the male pronoun because most narcissists are men and definitely most abusers are men. Right. physical abusers and so on. You know, it, there is a weeding out process. There's a filtering process. Uh, the vast, I mean, women, all women, 
would be delighted on the first or second date with a narcissist, and, and the vast majority of women would give up on a narcissist or a psychopath by the fifth date, because the emanations are there, the feeling that something is not right, that, that you know, something doesn't click, that there is something wrong, yes. that this this person is, is wrongly put together. The, the, the feeling of, fa of fakeness, the feeling that it's a forged facsimile of a human being, but not really a human being. And there was an expert, a robotics expert in, in Japan. His field was robotics, so he's an expert on robots. And he invented the concept of uncanny valley. He said that as robots become more and more similar to humans, they are likely to provoke feelings of unease and discomfort in their environment because everyone knows they're robots and yet they are so human. Right. And this discrepancy between human-like robots and the underlying steel and, and, uh, and aluminum, this discrepancy is what he called the uncanny valley. And so narcissists and psychopaths provoke the same ill-at-ease discomfiture in people. Whenever you meet, when you meet a psychopath or a narcissist, you keep, you keep, there's a dialogue. You keep having an internal dialogue which says, this guy looks so charming, so intelligent, so amazing. What's wrong with him? Why do I feel that something's wrong with him? And you can't, you can't put your finger on it, but you know that something's wrong with this guy, you know? So healthy, psychologically and mentally healthy women would usually disengage after a while. But there is a minority, and it's not insubstantial minority, of women who would actually latch on to the narcissist. And these women are usually codependents. Mm. Some of them are narcissists themselves, um, something called covert narcissism or inverted narcissism. And so the psychological profile of this type of intimate partner of a narcissist is, is also pathologic, in effect, long-term partner. Can you describe any more of what their pathology is, the long-term partner? Yeah, well, to be a long-term, to serve, as, and I'm using the word serve judiciously, you know, Yes. To serve as the long-term partner of a narcissist, um, you must have a very deficient or distorted grasp of yourself and of reality. Um, you must have what we call in psychology cognitive distortion, which consists of belittling and demeaning yourself while aggrandizing and adoring the narcissist. Partner is placing herself, as the long-term partner, mind you, yes. placing herself essentially in the position of an eternal victim. She is undeserving. She is punishable. She is a scapegoat, and it's it's. It, this kind of person, it's very important for her to appear moral, sacrificial, victimized. She is some, many, of, many of these women are not even aware of these predicaments. They perceive the narcissist um, as someone deserving of their sacrifice because he is superior in so many ways, intellectually, emotionally, morally, professionally, financially. But they are professional victims. And then we have... We have another type of, of long-term partner, the kind of partner which maintains a symbiotic relationship with the, with the narcissist. She's totally dependent on the narcissist, sometimes as a, so, as a source of supply, narcissistic or masochistic supply, mere attention, you know. So this, yes. kind, of, of, uh, this kind of partner is a codependent. She, has, she suffers from, from severe abandonment anxiety. She has very dysfunctional attachment and bonding styles. She's clinging. She is needy. Um, and and in the narcissist she finds uh this you know this partner that can can keep her on her toes if you wish that that can because she's this kind of partner is also a drama queen she she mm. she's a j adrenaline junkie she's addicted to the ups and downs she she loves these and whenever she is with a normal person a non narcissist she would find the part this kind of partner boring oh, okay. black and white you know the narcissist is the technicolor eruption in her life it totally. gives her life color and meaning it's a dance macabre you know it's a <laughs> Uh, it's a tango of, of, of two. One last thing that is uh, that is important to understand that it is not true that the common myth that no one survives the narcissist. You know, it's not true. There are very many narcissists have very stable relationships with their intimate partners. Only it's a match of pathologies. Mm -hmm. It's simply one pathology meets another, and then they bond. And the bond is very strong and very meaningful to both parties and survives for decades. But it's still a pathological bond, a dysfunctional bond. So many narcissists are stable in their marriage. And, and it's, it's not true that all narcissists end up being divorced and abandoned. It's absolutely, it's a myth. They, they find a good fit. Yeah, they find the lid. Exactly. To me, it seems that some of the traits of the psychopath are similar to the traits of someone who's really good at picking up women, who's a player, who's 
has all that charming, no empathy type of personality. Do you, am, am I off base and naive on that? No, I wouldn't say that you're off base and naive. I would make two, I would make two pertinent observations. One, the dating scene, the adult dating scene, let's say 40s and yes. 50s, 40s, 40 and 50 year olds dating scene is a negative filter. It is not representative of the whole population. This is a self-selecting group. This is a group of people who have failed in their relationship. They are divorced. They are, you know, they've never been married. This, the people on the dating scene are not representative, are not a representative sample. Most of the people on the dating scene, from my experience, and it's, we're talking 17 years experience of, of interviewing these people. I have a database of close to 120,000 cases and so on. Most of, uh, most of these people suffer from one form of dysfunction or another. They are not necessarily mentally ill, they are not necessarily personality disordered, but they are dysfunctional one way or another. And it is this dysfunction exactly that brought them into the dating scene. So yes, it's an easy hunting ground for the narcissist and the psychopath, the dating scene. And you find an unusual concentration of narcissists and psychopaths among those who date, um, both as pickup artists and as, uh, as the willing victims or the willing prey. This is not the case in the general population, or f- for example, in one's 20s. Or, or early 30s, when most of the stable long-term relationships are formed and getting to, to meet partners and, and potentially intimate partners in, in settings like, uh, you know, university, college. Right. And so I call it the general, the non-dating scene, the general population. In the general population, narcissists and psychopaths would have very little success and they very fast acquire very bad reputation. Exactly. And so if you are a 20-year-old narcissist, and you study in a college and you're beginning to date girls, you're going to suck. You're, it's, it's not going to work. Uh, they, the first girl you date will spread the word that you are a weirdo, you know. Right, right. You're not case, you're wacko. And, and that'll be the end of it and, and so on. So there's a lot of peer control and social control of fitness and compatibility in dating in these settings because they are reputation-based. They are not essentially anonymous. They're reputation-based. However, when one gets into one's 40s and 50s and is twice divorced and roams singles bars and strip clubs and I know what, or computer online dating websites and what have you, these are all negative filters. The people, I mean, the population which frequents these joints and or is on online dating sites is not a representative sample. It's a highly unique sub-subculture and subgroup. And among these people, as I said, mental health dysfunctions are very common and they are all very easy prey. And then you're right. Narcissists wow. and psychopaths would have an inordinate success among this group. Right. And their, their reputation isn't as easily shared. It's all, it, listen, on online dating sites, you can't believe a word. I mean, sure. it's, totally. it's anything like in between 90 and 100 percent fake. I mean, there's no reputation there. And when you go to a singles bar and you pick up a one night stand, it's also not reputation based. It's muscle based or whatever. So, for instance, there is a subtype of narcissist called the somatic narcissist. It's a narcissist who uses, leverages his body, his musculature, his sex appeal, his charm, and so on and so forth, in order to perpetrate a, seri- uh, a series of uh, sexual conquests. This kind of narcissist, a somatic narcissist, derives his narcissistic supply, derives the attention and adoration via his sexual conquests and his musculature and his, you know, bodybuilding and so on. The somatic narcissist roams these, exactly these places scores you know for it's a scoring game there's no emotional dimension to that there's no it's uh it's just notches on on his belt and so this is not a healthy scene that i'm trying to tell you and in this miasma in this unhealthy scene of course unhealthy characters like narcissists and psychopaths thrive i can see also you know like you mentioned even bars where everyone's going there for the very purpose of picking up or getting picked up would be a fertile hunting ground definitely a destiny it is it is a fertile hunting ground narcissists and psychopaths don't go there to get laid as most normal people would they go there to score they go there to wield power this is why some of these encounters end in rape. Because right. rape is not about sex. Rape is about power. It's, about, it's a power play. It's a mind game. So narcissists and psychopaths inhabit these places because they want to score, not in the sexual sense, but to score in the power play sense, to have power over others, to demonstrate to themselves and to others their, their remit, their, 
their capacity, their amazing ability to subjugate and subject and, and dominate and, and convert people to their cause and make them do what they want. It's a cult-like setting in the narcissist's mind. And, and the narcissist needs people to tell him time and again, you are the greatest, you are the best, you are the, you are the most sexual beast, you, know, you, are, you are the most brilliant, you are the perfect. He needs this. This is what we call narcissistic supply. Precisely because his sense of self-worth is very volatile. In the absence of narcissistic supply, the narcissist crumbles to dust, exactly like in vampire movies. He crumbles to dust, and that's why many people describe narcissists as energy vampires, because they suck your, your lifeblood, <laughs> your mental lifeblood. They, they, they demand, they demand sometimes aggressively that you reflect to them their grandeur, their grandiosity, that you consistently affirm and confirm to them how outstanding and superior they are, how essentially divine, inhuman they are. And so if you go to a bar, you know, singles bar, you want to get laid, that's a legitimate uh, destination and a legitimate quest. And if you find an appropriate partner, there's nothing wrong with it. I mean, enjoy. But the narcissists and the psychopaths are there not for this purpose. It's very dangerous. It's a very dangerous uh, and environment. Are they looking for that constant uh, affirmation verbally, or is it just the well, fact it that you're interested? Well, depends. If you're cerebral, yeah, sorry. I cut you off. I but, mean, it, just the fact that you're interested in them, is that enough, or do they need it verbally? Well, it depends. There are, as, I, as I said, there are two types of, two major types of narcissists, the cerebral and the somatic. The cerebral narcissist is, is a narcissist who places emphasis on his brain, his intellectual capacity, right. and his intelligence. So he needs you to tell him how brilliant, amazing, perfect, stunning, fascinating he is intellectually. And then, yes, it's verbal. He doesn't want or require anything more. He's actually pretty repelled by sex. And the vast majority of cerebral narcissists, one of which I am, are asexual. They don't, they don't have sex. So they won't go beyond that. They, they would, would stun you with intellectual pyrotechnics, with their vocabulary, with their ability to, to think and to, to rationalize and ratiocinate. And then they will say, you know, you're, you're really brilliant, you're amazing, and so on. That's, that'll be the, the end all and be all. And that's it. That's a narcissistic supply. However, if you're a somatic, a somatic narcissist is someone who uses mainly his sexuality to, to, to obtain narcissistic supply. And that would require sexual dominance and sexual consummation. That would require sexual conquest. And if when the narcissist is denied this conquest, this consummation, or this acknowledgement of his irresistibility, he becomes aggressive. He becomes aggressive not because he's rejected, but he becomes aggressive because he is a junkie without a drug, without his drug. He becomes aggressive the same way junkies become aggressive when they are denied their fix. And so this could become ugly, and, and usually it does, by the way. And then it depends on the narcissist. Some narcissists are aggressive but not violent. But a small, a small minority of narcissists are also psychopathic and uh, an even smaller minority are also sexual sadists. So this small minority, if you get on the wrong side, if you deny them what they think is their right because they are irresistible and uh, no one can withstand their charm, and, and if you deny that to their face, if you give them what I call negative narcissistic supply, then they may, be, may well become violent. And it's happened before, thousands of times. And it's easy to see how uh, the woman... A woman could wake up feeling very distant, used, you know, that it was uh, either an experience they wanted or... A... There is no woman in this encounter, but only a an It's an instrument of gratification. The narcissist needs her as an inflatable doll to, to prove to himself that he has the capacity to dominate and subjugate other people, especially uh, females if he is straight, but other people generally, regardless of sexual orientation. So he needs to subjugate and dominate. It's a, it's a power play, as I told you. It's a mind game. It's nothing to do with sex, or let alone with emotion or relationship or anything. So she, her job is to be there, wide-eyed, and to admire the narcissist and to succumb to his expressed and non-expressed wishes, thereby proving to him that he is worthy of adulation, admiration, and that he is irresistible. And that's her job. And once, once, she has, once, she had, once she has done her job, once it's over, he has no need for her. And she is dismissed. She is an object. He masturbates with her body. Right. It's, uh, narcissists and psychopaths are homoerotic. Not homoerotic in the sense that they are attracted to their own gender, right. like homosexuals, but in the sense that they are attracted to themselves. They are, as Freud said and others, they are this, their own sexual objects. So 
with a narcissist, you, as a woman, you may have sex with a narcissist, and it's, it'll be great as far as technique goes. You know, he, he's yes. going he's gonna to have the greater technique, and it's going to be pyrotechnics. You know, it's going to be you know fireworks. But at the end of the day, you will feel emptied, voided, because you have never been there. You have been an excuse. <laughs> you have been a conduit. You have been an instrument, a vessel, through which, via which, the narcissist obtain obtained an act of love making with himself. Indeed, this is narcissism. Malignant self love. And this is the title of my book. Malignant self love. And it's uh, similar for a psychopath. Yeah. Psychopath is even worse. Psychopath is even worse because psychopaths are almost invariably uh, violent. Today, the distinction between psychopath and narcissist is very blurred. With the publication of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, 5th edition, last year, it's been recognized that the, the lines, the demarcations the, between personality disorders in the past were very blurry, fuzzy, and superfluous. So today it's all merged. So they are narcissists, it's a spectrum. So some narcissists are psychopathic narcissists. And these people are usually violent. So with the psychopath, it's much worse because it's likely to involve you know, some violent, ritualized violence, like in Sadomaso, or real violence. You know? Your description of the narcissist uh, having sex, needing that constant verbal uh, admiration sounds a lot like porn. Sounds like yes, of course. Narcissists are notorious porn addicts. Of course, it, it sounds. It definitely sounds like the way porn is constructed these days. I haven't come across a single narcissist, and I have come across thousands. By far, I have the biggest database in the world on narcissism. That. Just to give you, just to give you a, a measure of comparison, the, most of the studies on narcissism in academe involve usually twenty or thirty people. My database includes thousands of people diagnosed with narcissism, and I have had very long, detailed interactions with them online, admittedly, and they've answered my questions because they regard me as one of them, you know, so yes. I'm, in the bro I'm in the brotherhood. Yes. <laughs> and so I, I can tell you that I have yet to come across a narcissist who is not a porn addict. Addict, I mean, addict is a strong word, but like, who doesn't find porn very appealing and who doesn't, who is not exposed to porn at least once a day. Sam, your books, Malignant Self-Love, is, you know, looks like a really valuable tool for anyone who relates to other people, just to know who you're dealing with or to see in yourself some of the traits. Um, yeah, I think, I think you're touching on a very, very important point, often, often neglected in, in other interviews and write-ups and so on. Narcissism is, is a, a tidal wave. It's on the rise. Our society and culture are narcissistic. We have constructed, we have embedded narcissism as a foundation stone of the edifice in which we live. So narcissism permeates every cell, every social cell, and every cultural aspect. Therefore, Malignance of Love is a guidebook not only to, you know, a husband, a, a, a boss, a narcissistic boss, narcissistic husband, or whatever, but it's a guidebook to modern life. It's regrettably, regrettably, even when you don't come across narcissists, you inevitably come across narcissism somewhere. And you can have narcissistic collectives, like a narcissistic bureaucracy, the, the VA administration, <laughs> if you wish. You, 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 you can come across narcissistic um, uh, church, narcissistic parish. You, you can come across narcissistic clubs and narcissistic political parties and narcissistic narcissism. And I was not the first to suggest it. I mean, the first one was, uh, was Christopher Lash in 1976 in his seminal book, The Culture of Narcissism. Narcissism is no longer a phenomenon isolated to the cabinets of psychiatrists with German names. Narcissism is all around us. The, we are awash in narcissism and gradually psychopathy. So it's very frightening. And you, everyone needs a guidebook to this brave new world, brave, ominous new world. You have you list um, other books like The Toxic Relationships, It's a, Abuse and Its Aftermath. Is that part of Malignant Self-Love? Um, Right now, we are selling. My publisher is selling a, a series of sixteen books that I have written on on narcissism, personality disorders, but also specifically on relationships with narcissists and with psychopaths. And I mean, people can buy the whole series, or or they can buy volumes individually. Some okay. volumes deal with specific relationship issues. Yes, abuse in relationship, how to cope with narcissists in in the you know 
in various settings. When you take them to court, when 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 they are when you have a, co- a narcissistic coworker or narcissistic boss, so in the workplace, there is no shortage of of uh, context for narcissism, and there is no shortage of books on 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 narcissism. And mine are an early and um, periodically updated contribution to to this field. These look terrific. I've had clients who you know using your your books, your knowledge, your information would have been very helpful to them. There is no access to the narcissist mind, except if you are a narcissist. In this sense, it really takes one to know one. Yeah. So I keep reading these scholarly studies and, and uh, books written by victims and observers, and I chuckle. I keep laughing, you know, yeah. because they don't get it right. It's, uh, it is such a solips- The narcissist mind is such solipsistic monastic universe that it's it's a it's a, it's a mob it's a mafia you know you need to be a wise guy <laughs> to yes. know what's going on you totally so agree. only one narciss- only a narcissist knows what it means to be a narcissist it is a, it's an experience which is exclusive mutually exclusive with the human it's really unique sam i want to thank you so much for your time <clears throat> i really thank you for having me it's been fascinating i'd love to revisit with you after I digest some of this unique perspective you've given me. And My I, pleasure. Thank you. I want to, again, just point out your book, Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited, and your website, samvac, S-A-M-V-A-K, dot tripod, dot com. Yes, or www.narcissistic-abuse.com. Because it's just a fantastic resource, and I really appreciate the work you're doing. I appreciate you having me. Thank Have you. a nice day there. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye.